Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second edition of The Boneyard. Uh, now, I have to apologize in advance in case you hear any squeaks or, or chittering. Uh, I'm right next to the window here, and apparently there's a bird outside, which is very, very exciting for the cats. But uh, enough about extant felids. Let's talk about some fossil stuff. Um, so one of the coolest things that came out in the past week or so was a discovery uh, that was out in biology letters of bone boring snot worms. Um, some people don't like that I call them that. Their technical name is called Ozidax. There's a variety of species, really. See, already we're having Charlotte get in the way. <laughs> um, so bone worms. Uh, so these are and old worms that were discovered not so long ago, discovered in uh, the late 1970s, if I remember correctly. And uh, they were on the carcass of a whale. They were actually living in the bone. They have this uh, kind of root system that they send down and um, you know, absorb materials from the bone. These are the feet. cycle, but no one had ever seen anything quite like this before, and it became part of what scientists ended up calling whale falls, and more generally dead falls. So when you have organisms that live close to the surface, like whales do, uh, they fall to the deep ocean, and they become basically an island of biodiversity in the deep sea. I mean, some of these exist in the shallows as well, but most of them have been seen in the deep sea, where you have uh, what's called the mobile scavenger phase, so you have sharks and things like that coming along and ripping off big hunks of blubber and all this stuff. And then you have um, so the, the second stage where you have uh, you know Ozodex worms and other critters really like burrowing into the bone, um, making the most of the tatters that remain. And then from there, you have uh, the sulfophilic stage in which you have these mats of bacteria and other organisms will come along and sort of graze on that. But you know this can take decades, you know it's, it's decades of life being given back by this dead whale. Um, so when marine biologists discovered this, some paleontologists were thinking, well, wait, you know, whales have been around for quite a long time, but we've also had marine reptiles for quite a long time. Um, you know, about 255 million years ago, multiple lineages of marine reptiles started basically slipping back into the sea. You had, um, you know, the origin of turtles, it's the very first ones, might have been marine, but were certainly aquatic. You had these weird things called hoopasuchians that had this like armored uh, body tube, this bony tube that surrounded their body. Uh, you had the predecessors of plesiosaurs, those four paddled, long necked marine reptiles. You had the predecessors of ichthyosaurs, and the more fish like, sort of swimming side to side marine reptiles. You had the placodonts, um, this group that had uh, basically known as the shell crushers of, of their day, these barrel bodied sorts of things that were eating a lot of uh, shellfish. Um, all these things are entering the water at the same time. They're prol proliferating throughout the Mesozoic, uh, you know, during the same time that the uh, non-avian dinosaurs are stomping around on, on land. Um, and then in the Cretaceous, you have a little bit of the changing of the guard. You get the Mosasaurs, so basically these enormous relatives of today's Komodo dragons, monitor lizards, making their bid to enter the ocean. The last of these died out about 66 million years ago, mostly leaving the sea turtles behind. I mean, they're marine iguanas and sea snakes and marine reptiles, but the really big ones, um, you know, all except the sea turtles died out about 66 million years ago. But I mean, that's a long time. That's over, you know, 170 million years of having these large critters swimming through the ocean. So paleontologists thought, well, if these worms exist on whales today, if we have whale falls, uh, why not marine reptile falls? Why not dead falls in a general sense going way back into the past? Um, the trick was actually identifying them. Uh, so, you know, paleontologists started going back into their collections and they started finding evidence of dead falls and of these Ozodax worms going back millions of years, but it seemed to peter out about 30 million years ago. And um, there was genetic evidence as well. You can look at, you know, molecular biology to get an idea of when certain lineages may have diverged from one another. And based upon that, uh, modern biologists were suspecting that these bone burrowing worms uh, basically diverged from other annelids about 45 million years ago, so about the time that um, the first whales to live entirely at sea are basically taking on that lifestyle, or back in the Cretaceous, so you know, tens of millions of years earlier during the time of these marine reptiles, and there wasn't really a great way to, to test this because the fossil record hadn't been so extensively studied. and. Um, as Mesozoic paleontologists in particular started to look at uh, evidence for deadfalls, it was really, really frustrating because they kept finding evidence of these deadfall communities, but not the bone boring worms. So there were a couple of plesiosaurs found um, 
in rock off uh, Japan, and or at least in ancient marine rocks found now found in Japan. And they seem to be from this late phase, these mats of bacteria that snails, uh, that only seem to exist in these ephemeral communities, live on today. Um, so this was a late stage deadfall. And then um, last year, um, there was a uh, announcement about Nichthyosaur that was found in shallow water that seemed to show this succession of um, marine organisms feeding on this carcass. So it didn't have to be just a deep water phenomenon. It could also happen in the shallows as well. But again, there are traces of all different kinds of critters except for Ozodax worms. Um, now, it, I mean, this would seem to suggest that the worms weren't there, but the other possibility is that we just weren't finding evidence of them. Well, in a new study um, published in Biology Letters, uh, Sylvia Denise and Nicholas Higgs have finally announced that they found evidence of Ozodax worms in uh, Cretaceous fossils, fossils about 100 million years old or so, uh, the upper arm bone of uh, Plesiosaur, and also on the shell of a sea turtle. Um, now, the way they identified these, you know, because there, there are lots of things that can make holes in uh, in bone. You know, you can have, you know, the radula of a snail or something scraping away. Uh, certain kinds of bacteria can make holes. I mean, the, the plesiosaurs that were found off Japan, those seem to have tiny holes in them made by bacteria rather than worms. So the way that they identified that these were actually Ozodax burrows were by taking CT scans and seeing that you basically have a pinhole opening on the outside, and that opens into a chamber where the root system grows. So it's pretty good evidence from trace fossils that these worms were doing their thing about 100 million years ago. And paired with some other fossil evidence that suggests to paleontologists that these worms are actually opportun opportunists because you have this 20 million year gap, right, between the extinction of the last large marine reptiles with the exception of turtles, and then the origin of the first whales that are taking the sea. So, uh, the first whales are living entirely at sea for that matter. Um, so you have this gap in between them. You know, what were the worms doing? Did you have the multiple evolution of this or these multiple forms of worms? I mean, you have some bone burrowing organisms around, some today like domestic beetles. Uh, there are multiple varieties of beetle that do this, that independently evolved this lifestyle. Maybe it was true for worms as well. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case because based upon experimental studies and also some fossils, you know, the Ozodax worms, they don't need to feed just on really large stuff basically any bone that gets down to into the sea, they can utilize. There's been experiments with cow bones being sunk at different depths, and they get colonized by Ozodax worms. And there are fossil fish bones and bird bones also showing damage from Ozodax worms. So if basically anything that falls down to the proper depth, depth and becomes exposed, they can utilize. So they've been doing their thing for over 100 million years. I mean, who knows when, when they started? You know, maybe it's far back. Maybe it's back when all these marine reptiles started invading the ocean. There are these large food sources that weren't there before. I mean, this marine reptile invasion of the sea is the first time anything like this happened in the history of life on Earth. So who knows how far back it goes, but it goes back at least 100 million years. And I think that's pretty cool. It's good to see this evidence finally come to light. You know, it's something that marine biologists and paleontologists expected for quite a while. Uh, but now there's finally the evidence to to back this up. And uh, you know, since we started with the marine realm, we might as well continue with it. One of the other stories that has come out in recent weeks was about baby mosasaurs. Um, so you know, marine reptiles, as they made their living out in the sea, most of them, with the exception of sea turtles, ended up uh, having live young. Uh, so especially in the last few years, paleontologists have found group after group that has either embryos or you know, well-developed young inside. I mean, the ichthyosaurs, the ones from the Holzmod in Germany uh, that were found in the 19th century, those are amongst the most famous. Those are the ones where you have, uh, you know, sometimes it's interpreted as the baby ichthyosaur being born, being pushed out, you know, in, in, de in death. And this was this, you know, very tragic moment. It seems that actually, in fact, that this, you know, youngster was still inside its mother and gases from decomposition pushed out. But all the same, it was really tantalizing evidence that, you know, these reptiles were giving birth out at sea, and group after group after group, with, again, the exception of sea turtles, they seem to be sticking out like a sore thumb in this episode for whatever reason, um, gave live birth in the ocean. Um, now, for mosasaurs, the, the mosasaur group proper, the ones that we think about, like Mosasaurus itself and Tylosaurus, as far as we know, they haven't been found with young inside them just yet, or at least it hasn't been published. But uh, mosasauroids, so if you go back one level of generalization, 
those have been found with embryos inside. So if it's in an archaic member of the group, chances are it's inherited by the rest. And it makes sense, given that these were many of these were animals that lived um, away from the shoreline, that they had these extensive aquatic adaptations, uh, flippers, tails that kinked downwards, that had a uh, tail fin on them, uh, streamlined scales. Uh, you know, these were not animals that would have been very good clambering back out onto the sand to dig nests the way that sea turtles do. So this particular study that was led by uh, Daniel Field and his colleagues at Yale uh, basically looked at what were once considered bird bones, bird jaw bones, and uh, they were collected sometime in the 19th century. And they were just, you know, interpreted as uh, the remnants of these toothed birds that uh, the paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh remember him from last episode with his battles about Uintotherium. Um, as some of his toothed birds, things like Hesperornis and Ichthyornis, you know, back when birds had teeth. And I know that might give some of you nightmares, but it actually was the case for the Cretaceous, you know, it, for, for quite a while. Um, and paleontologists went along with this for a number of decades. And then somebody went and looked back at these and said, actually, these are not bird jaws. These are from very young mosasaurs. And they're from a spot in what used to be called the Western Interior Seaway. So this warm, shallow sea that washed over much of North America, split it into two parts. You had Appalachia uh, to the east and Laramidia to the west, Laramidia being the continent where a lot of dinosaurs from my home state uh, of Utah are being found, things like Utah Ceratops and Cosmoceratops and Lithranax and all that stuff living on the coast of, of that Western continent. But the mosasaurs, they're out in the middle of it, out in the middle of this warm, shallow see. And uh, the fossils, based upon where they were found, uh, would have been, you know, hundreds of kilometers away from the, near, the nearest shoreline. So these baby mosasaurs, it's not like they're found in what could be interpreted as a near shore sort of nursery or that they slipped back into the water after being born on land the way that sea turtles do. Um, it seems to be another line of evidence that they're giving live birth out in the ocean. And that's pretty cool that we have a, a, another line of evidence to um, support with so long uh, been uh, supposed <laughs> about these marine reptiles. Sorry, I'm a little bit stuffy. I'm still a little bit ill this week. I appear to be getting my yearly cold, so that's why my brain isn't firing quite as well as I would like it to. Um, and speaking of, you know, since I mentioned turtles so much, I'll only mention this briefly if there are any turtle aficionados watching this. Um, but there's a new issue of the Journal of Experimental Zoology Part B, that's the Molecular and Developmental uh, Evolution aspect of it. And they have a lot of papers in there devoted to turtles and their evolution. Um, now, turtles might seem, you know, a little bit mundane in some ways. Their reptiles are still around. You can go and you can see them, you know, out in the wild. You can see them at zoos. Um, and in some ways, you know, we don't appreciate them because they're still around, but they really are strange, strange critters. Um, you know, and for a while, I actually knew some creationists who, who loved turtles because they proposed that, you know, the first turtles that show up in the fossil record are entirely turtles and there's no evidence for evolution in turtles. You know, the first turtle is a turtle and they've been the same way since the Triassic. No evolution is happening. Well, of course, they're wrong and they've become increasingly wrong in the past uh, couple of years with the um, discovery of fossils like Odontochiles uh, showing the evolution of the shell, um, work that Tyler Lyson and other people are doing with uh, something called Unotosaurus, so sh showing the expansion of the ribs, the arrangement of the turtle carapace, how that actually came together, how those shoulder blades, which for us are on the outside and the turtle are on the inside of the shell, all this these disparate aspects that um, you know biologists had trouble explaining for a long time, and they're finally trying to get them. Into blue. There's still a lot of debate. There's still some debate, for example, about whether turtles are um, more closely related to alligators and crocodiles and birds, so close to the archosaur radiation, or their their own separate groups somewhere else in reptiles. Um, it seems to be like they're nesting somewhere close to archosaurs, if not within the archosaur group proper. But they're really real. They're really strange critters, and, and if you're into that sort of thing and you want all the technical details, uh, you certainly want to check out this edition of the journal. Um, so I'll switch to mammals now. I've, I've given the reptiles <laughs> plenty of time. I guess you know I gave invertebrates some time as well, which you know being a vertebrate person uh, is is relatively rare. Um, but I learned something cool about woolly mammoths this past week. Uh, so there is a paper that came out uh, based upon a very well preserved uh, woolly mammoth skeleton called uh, yucca that was found in Siberia. So not quite as pretty as uh, Liuba or Chroma. You might have seen both those woolly mammoths, uh, young individuals, in the news a lot in the past couple of years. Um, yucca had, you know, the skeleton, the skin had kind of sloughed off or become separated in some parts of it. But uh, the yucca 
specimen had a trunk with it. So it allowed um, biologists from Ru Russia, led by uh, Vivi Plotnikov, to actually dissect the trunk and see what its anatomy looked like. How does it compare to that of modern day elephants? And if you look at a modern day elephant, its trunk is really an amazing appendage. You know, it's, it has those sorts of ridges. It looks like a flexible tube. It's got the fingers at the end for, for nice grasping. Um, and you know, the mammoth had some of the same traits. Um, you know, it had you know even longer uh, finger-like projections at the end to help it better grasp grasses that grew on the cold steppe environments in which mammoths lived. Um, but also another feature that we don't see in modern-day elephants, and that's this expansion about a third of the way up the trunk, and uh, it seems to be what the researchers described as a like a cobra's hood, in a way. Um, and they came up with two different ideas for why woolly mammoths might have had this strange expansion on their appendage. The one that they spend most of the time on was that, um, you know, in the height of the Ice Age winters, that woolly mammoths might not have been able to find enough unfrozen water to drink. They might have, you know, become very easily dehydrated. So in that situation, they might have to do what some large modern mammals do, and that's eat snow. Now, eating snow can be very energy uh, intensive. You, you expend a lot of energy doing this because it takes heat to melt that snow and turn it into water. So it can actually kind of be a dangerous proposition. It turns into a, a big energy waste trying to convert snow to water, but you know, you can only go so long without water, and water for some of these large mammals is very important to digestion. So, you know, given the choice, you know, between expending losing some of your heat and getting some water, water will usually win out. So what they were proposing was that mammoths have this expansion on their trunks so that they could basically make a little snowball in the trunk and loop it up underneath and in that pocket uh, that would warm the snow and melt it and basically the water would run in, you know they'd think um, it's a plausible idea we have no direct evidence that this actually happened it's you know we always run into this problem with um, fossil behavior between what an animal actually did and what it could do um, but I like the other idea that they came up with and these are not mutually exclusive um, it's that you know that pocket was basically used to warm that trunk. So basically these animals would have to graze much of the day. Grass is not a very um, energy rich sorts of vegetation uh, and large animals that eat grass have to eat a lot of it. Uh, so it's you know grazing for you know 10 hours or more a day and especially in some of these very cold environments uh, they might have basically suffered from frostbite if the the tips of their thing if the <laughs> tips of their fingers the finger like projections at the end of their trunk were exposed all day to this you know snuffling around plucking up grasses so it was a way to basically warm those finger like projections up which would you know would lose heat very very quickly it's you know very far from the body it's very um has got the surface air that would radiate heat off of it you know it could very easily get frozen um they might have curled the tips of their trunk back up into those flaps and warmed it up for a minute or two and then gone back to grazing so it would have been you know an easier way uh, to avoid this this frostbite problem than you know trying to like lay on their trunk or stick it in their mouth or or something like that so again we, we don't know whether mammoths actually did this or not but certainly an interesting idea i mean this this flap seems consistent across multiple woolly mammoth specimens it seems a common feature of their group so was likely there for a reason. It doesn't seem to be some kind of exaptation or something that just, you know, uh, basically proceeded from the development of, of, of the trunk. It seemed for something. Uh, and the one way that we would find out whether this was the case, actually the case or not, would be by looking at more cave art. I mean, we're fortunate with woolly mammoths that people actually saw them, and at least in Eurasia, made cave paintings and other artwork of them. So we could you have this independent check about what these animals actually look like. For example, the extent of the hair on their bodies, you know, where the hump was at the withers, all these details of uh, woolly mammoths that, you know, we can get a good idea of from the fossils, but um, it's so much better to have someone who had actually seen it, illustrating it in, in um, you know, relative clarity for us. So maybe someday someone will find uh, a beautiful cave painting showing a mammoth with its trunk all curled up, um, maybe some water or something dripping from it. I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath for it, but it would certainly be interesting. Uh, and this is a big week for a uh, uh, Maybe I will in the next episode, but the one that came out already, um, it has a relatively plain name but it's got a cool story and it's a really weird dinosaur it's called chilesaurus uh, let me just look look at the name to make sure i'm pronouncing the um 
species name, right? So it's Chile Saurus Diego Suarez I. Uh, and this is a dinosaur that was found by a seven year old kid. He was out with his uh, geologist parents and they were taking sections and hiking around. And uh, young Diego was picking up cow bones and uh, just whatever looked interesting on the ground, collected a whole bunch of fossil bones and he showed them to his sister who was out with the family. And, and the sister's like, yeah, that's really cool. You should show mom and dad. And mom these were dinosaur bones, and they were standing in this boneyard um, in this Jurassic outcrop that was full of these small dinosaur bones. Uh, and that was in 2004. This dinosaur just got named in Nature on Monday. And um, what makes it so unusual is that it's an herbivorous theropod. Now, when I was a kid, a theropod was basically synonymous with meat-eating dinosaur. You know, Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, Velociraptor, Deinonychus, um, Spinosaurus all theropod dinosaurs is basically the theropods are the meat eaters, everything else, the plant eaters. Um, well, some paleontologists suspected otherwise for a few groups, things like the ornithomimids, these ostrich mimic dinosaurs that, you know, have didn't have any teeth to process this. Sorry, I'm worried that my cat is stopping the broadcast again. <laughs> anyway, ornithomimids, you know, they, they seem like they might be more omnivores than, than strict uh, carnivore like Troodon itself. Um, they look very much like Velociraptor, but they had a, a larger number of small teeth. So uh, the suggestion was made that, you know, maybe they were omnivores rather than strict carnivores. Um, but in the past decade or so, paleontologists have identified multiple groups, you know, some of which have gut contents and other sorts of direct evidence that started from carnivorous ancestors and became either omnivorous or herbivorous, things like the Oviraptorosaurs, so these parrot-like small dinosaurs with the uh, toothless beaks and the crests on their head, Therizinosaurs, the ones with the um, beaky small heads, long necks, tubby bodies, and sickle-like claws on, on their hands, ornithomimids, uh, troodonids, or more omnivores. Uh, there's a, a, a ceratosaur called Limusaurus uh, that was described a few years ago. Um, they like Ceratosaurus itself or Carnotaurus, some of those later forms, you know, long teeth, certainly carnivorous looking animals, but Lumusaurus, um, toothless, very small, did not look like a consummate killer at all. Um, and that seemed to be the earliest representative of Nerb. Um, well, this week, along comes Chilesaurus, about the same age, late Jurassic, about 150 million years old, and it belongs to yet another, another group seems to be a relatively archaic member of a group called Tetanurin dinosaurs. This is a large theropod group, includes But it's uh, this this uh, mishmash of, of different features. So even though it has this relationship to carnivores, um, it, its teeth are leaf-shaped, so it didn't go totally toothless, but it has um, teeth that are more off, often identified in other dinosaur groups, things like the sauropodomorphs, uh, ornithischian dinosaurs, herbivorous dinosaurs, in other words, um, that are, are used for shearing through plant material rather than chawing flesh. I mean, sure, it probably could have eaten some insects if it wanted to, but it seems to have this consistent dental signal. That these leaf-shaped teeth are related to uh, at least a good degree of herbivory. And it also had um, two fingers, uh, at least two functioning fingers on each hand. There's the sort of the stub of a, a third, but these blunt clawed, relatively large two fingers on each hand, so not the raptorial kind of grabbing talons that you see in other theropod dinosaurs. Um, so the evidence altogether looks like this was yet another herbivorous dinosaur, which means that herbivory evolved from carnivorous ancestors dinosaurs this is something that happened over and over again why it happened what allowed it to happen that's difficult to say you know maybe in some of these environments it was just easier to be an herbivore than than a carnivore that you know some of these dinosaurs might have been a little more flexible more of an omnivore and then you know through evolutionary time prey all the time so they might have used that flexibility to to make that switch um, but one of the cool things about Chile source is that it's not just like we have one fragment of one skeleton, or even one skeleton. Uh, the bones from the animal that are known are from multiple individuals, and it seems that it's the most numerous dinosaur, the most numerous tetrapod, um, even. Uh, so that's the most, would be the most numerous, you know, four-limbed vertebrate living on land that are meant 
fishing dinosaurs, things like you know Camptosaurus, uh, you know Dryosaurus, things like things like that. Um, but in this particular environment, in for Chilosaurus, it's the most numerous. So by invading this uh, herbivorous lifestyle uh, allowed it to really proliferate and, and take over a niche that so that's quite strange and that's, you know, uh, some people have been calling it the platypus dinosaur. I'm not a huge fan of the title. I actually don't quite see how, the, how that fits. Um, but whatever you call it, it's a, surely a, a strange animal and it's, it's good to see it published. Um, and yesterday was uh, World Taper Day. So I don't have any taper facts off the top of my head that I can share with you, but I certainly recommend that you go and check out uh, Darren last year, full of wonderful facts about these snouty mammals, which are still with us and are also Ice Age survivors. It's tapers here. that they were certainly here. Um, and the species that are alive today uh, are ones that made it through the Ice Age extinctions. And we have one species in Asia, and you've got multiple species in South America, and there's a whole thing, how did this happen? You know, is it basically uh, the extinction of all the ones in North America, you know, deleting this, this bridge between species that used to exist? There's lots of detail that we can go into there, but I recommend that you check out Darren's blog for that. And this is uh, relatively on the short side for this talk, but I'm going to end with a, a sort of plea for, for your assistance. If you enjoy this, or if you enjoy my writing or other things that I do, I've started a Kickstarter. Um, it's titled Have Allosaurus Will Travel. And uh, it's basically for me to buy a field vehicle. So much of what I do you know, every summer is I go out with different museums, uh, different uh, universities and colleges to volunteer to dig up fossils, go looking for fossils, work in quarries, go prospecting. And uh, this summer in particular, I'm going to write a lot about it. I'm going to make a lot of videos from the field, uh, interviewing different researchers. I plan on a book coming out of this all about what field work is actually like. Um, I know this will shock you, but it's not quite like Jurassic Park where you just brush off a skull and you know I have a whole articulated skeleton right there in front of you. Um, really about the, the joy and the passion of, of this because, I mean, really you have to love it to Um, and all the things that, that come with it. You know, it is forwarding science by making new discoveries. But at the same time, I feel like uh, the process of it is sometimes lost because we end up talking about the result to bring these animals to life. So, you know, even $5 would be an, an, an immense help to this project to, to, you know, get this field vehicle so I can go out to all these different sites I need to visit. Uh, so I certainly thank you for your assistance if you're interested in helping me with that. And with that, I think I will close for this week. Oh, I should going with a dead guy ale uh, that Rogue makes. That's cool. Uh, it had a skeleton on the label, um, which you know might be a dangerous proposition, picking, judging a beer by its cover. But uh, it seems to have worked out pretty well. So if you enjoy that sort of thing, I certainly recommend it. And I will see you next time.